friends, uh, coming to one more talk of Karnataka Pulmonology Association, I would like to introduce Dr. Lakshmi Narsiman R, who will be speaking about bronchoscopy back to basics. Uh, welcome, Doctor. Hi, Dr. Vinash. Good evening to everyone on behalf of Karnataka Pulmonology Association. I am Dr. R. Lakshmi Narsiman. I am a consultant pulmonologist at Columbia Asia Hospital, Mysore. So today I've been given the topic of uh, speaking about the basics of bronchoscopy. So it's a procedure which we do day in, day out. And we do almost hundreds of procedure every year. But uh, still, we need to know the basics. And for postgraduates who are just about to start learning the interventions and uh, going about uh, uh, thinking how to do interventions, it is very important to know that uh, the basics are always very important for any procedure what to do what not to do when to do when not to do so i'll be speaking about that apologies for some uh, technical issues where my video is not appearing i believe but uh, i'll try to be as expressive as possible with my voice so i plan to cover the following uh, in my session today the first is the history and evolution of bronchoscopy as an intervention and the types of bronchoscopy the indications and contraindications, the relevant anatomy of the upper and lower airway, and uh, uh, how to prepare the patient, how to take consent, uh, steps in basic flexible bronchoscopy, and then I'll be sh sharing a very short video after that, at that point, and uh, then I'll be telling you about the complications which we need to know and be aware of, and uh, what are the current applications and future perspectives. So. What is an endoscopy? Endoscopy is any procedure that looks into the body's tubes and cavities. It could be a colonoscopy, esophagoscopy, gastroscopy, or a bronchoscopy. So these are used to diagnose various diseases and also sometimes for therapeutic purposes. Bronchoscopy is direct visualization of the airways, that is the tracheobronchial tree. It could be done using rigid or flexible instruments. The main applications are as a clinical tool, to uh, see the airway anatomy, to sample any abnormal pathological uh, areas and for therapeutic purposes and also as a research tool. So it is defined as a technique of visualizing the inside of airways for diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. Flexible bronchoscopy since its inception has had an exponential growth in pulmonology and uh, the adv advantages of maneuverability the feasibility of wide spectrum of diagnostics and therapeutics, patient comfort has established flexible bronchoscopy as the most important weapon. But uh, going back to the history, it was not so simple. The history of bronchoscopy goes back to more than 200 years old. 1807, Philip Bozzini, he was a German army surgeon. He discovered the principle of light conduction and uh, precursor of endoscopes and uh, then we had the glottiscopes which was a laryngoscopy and then uh, uh, G. Johnson extracted a penny impacted in the throat of a child using a laryngoscope so that uh, was probably the first instance of a foreign body removal but uh, these were all early experiments and people were mainly doing laryngoscope but uh, Father of bronchoscopy is called as Gustav Killian. In 1895, Alfred Kirstein first visualized the vocal cord using an esophagoscope, but then Gustav Killian examined the trachea and main bronchi. So this was the first time trachea was entered into. And in another person, he removed the bone from the right main bronchus. And also three more foreign bodies he removed. And he coined the term direct bronchoscopy. And uh, uh, similarly, other uh, instruments were used, like a urethroscope uh, by uh, Coolidge to remove a hard rubber cannula from right main bronchus. So this was a picture of Killian. You can see that it's basically a rigid pipe, which he has inserted into the uh, vocal cords and into the trachea. Cavalier Jackson, he was a pioneer because he's considered the father of American bronchoesophagology. This is in 1913. You can see that he modified the rigid bronchoscope 
to include the light source at one end. And uh, this, so the first almost 100 years of bronchoscopy was all about rigid bronchoscopy. Then came Shigeto Ikeda. He developed the first flexible bronchoscope with uh, Pentax and Olympus company. And uh, his motto was, there is more hope with the bronchoscope. And uh, this had a, uh, this revolutionized the field, basically, because uh, there was great maneuverability with an ability to flex the scope to 180 and 120 degrees in flexion and extension. And now the fiber optic scopes have even been replaced, uh, replaced by the video bronchoscope, which have a charge coupled device chip located at the end. So you can see that the major milestones, Christine, Gustav, Killian, Chevalier, Jackson, and the latest being the Japanese, Shigeto Iketa. And uh, since then, there has been a rapid progress. You can see that uh, TBNA in 1979, laser therapy in 81, lung transplantation, bronchial stents, EBUS, which uh, has become, uh, everyone wants to have an EBUS now. So that came in the last 15, 20 years, electromagnetic navigation, and we have progressed rapidly. Coming to the basic types, but still there are two basic types. One is the rigid bronchoscope and one is the flexible. And in flexible, most of you would have seen both the fiber optic scope and the video bronchoscope. And uh, this is the rigid bronchoscope and this is the fiber optic scope. This is how a rigid scope looks. The patient is completely anesthetized and uh, the scope is inserted. This is the set of instruments. I won't be speaking much about the rigid bronchoscopy because it is an advanced procedure, but you still need to know that it requires an OT setup with an operating table, an anesthesiologist, and uh, you need all the, it requires a lot of setup basically. And uh, the indications are mainly central airway obstruction and a treatment of large central airway tumors, stenting, tracheal stenosis, tracheoesophageal fistula, emergency control of bleeding, cryo TBLB and in pediatric it's mainly used to retrieve foreign bodies and uh, through the rigid bronchoscope the fiber optic scope can also be introduced and via that you can take biopsies you can use laser for ablation and you can uh, use uh, various instruments like these can be inserted through the rigid bronchoscope the advantages of rigid bronchoscopy are it has a white channel through which large biopsies and foreign white large biopsies can be taken and foreign bodies can be grasped and uh, also allows for procedures like stenting, coring, dilatation and uh, superior suction capability and you get better control of the airway. So generally therapeutic procedures you go for rigid bronchoscopy but the disadvantages are lack of maneuverability, requirement of an anesthetist, steep learning curve. And it is quite traumatic. So it is not for beginners. It is only for advanced. Coming to the next common type, which is the flexible bronchoscopy. And as you can see, this is the older type of flexible bronchoscope called the fiber optic scope, where it is long and thin, and it contains a fiber optic system that transmits the image. And uh, using Bowden cables, the, uh, the lever at... Uh, your, uh, your thumb can move, manipulate the liver and uh, that can uh, allow flexion and extension of the scope. And it also includes a channel, which is a common channel for both suction and instrumentation. And But these are significantly smaller than those in a rigid bronchoscope. So this is where the light source is there, the eyepiece, and this is the patient end. And uh, so this is a fiber optic scope where you have an eyepiece or a camera attachment and this is a video scope where you have you don't have any camera attachment you have a connection where the both the camera and the light source connect and here at the distal end you can see the lens and a ccd chip ccd doesn't mean coffee day here means the charge coupled diode so the ccd chip this is the one which transmits the image and uh, this is directly transmitted to the processor and you can only see it in a, uh, a screen, a monitor. You cannot see it through the eyepiece. And this is how uh, eyepiece uh, bronchoscopy looks like. The advantages are the rigid bronchoscopy 
it's a wider lumen, as I said, and allows for ventilating, but uh, and larger therapeutic procedures can be done. But flexible is can be done at bedside. It uh, can be used for most diagnostic procedures. Uh, flexible is the one which is used. So I'll move on to the and it can be also be bronchoscopy can also be divided based on diagnostic or therapeutic, which is I'll come to the indications. But uh, one kind of classification is whether it's rigid or flexible, and the other kind of classification is whether it's diagnostic or therapeutic. And uh, this is the tip of a scope, what I told, where you have a objective lens, an aspiration channel, and the light guide. So it's very important to take care of the scope. And this is a bronchoscopy suite, where you have uh, the video bronchoscope attached to a screen. And this is where the patient uh, lies down. And uh, so, you know, in one single picture, you can see the difference between a fiber optic bronchoscope and a video bronchoscope. So there needs to be a camera attachment separately for the fiber optic scope, whereas the single cable carries both the image and the light in this uh, video bronchoscope. And this is the suction channel and this is the instrument channel, and this is the liver, which is used to manipulate the distal end of the scope. Coming to the indications and contraindications and diagnostic, where sometimes we have patients who have persistent wheezing, cough, or hemoptysis. Many people are, sometimes a trial of treatment is given with bronchodilators, doesn't improve. It does, uh, it does help in doing bronchoscopy because many of these patients may have some airway obstruction. Where you have an atelectasis or collapse of a lobe or a lung, you have a localized opacity on an X-ray or a CT scan. We have an obstructive emphysema, which is due to air trapping, which could be due to a foreign body. We have hilar or mediastinal shadows, a vocal cord palsy. And specifically for when you've done a specific, when you've done a scan, you get an atelectasis, you get a recurrent pneumonia, you get a persistent wheeze. Suspected airway compression, strider, upper airway obstruction. These are the various indications. And sometimes even for evaluation of tracheostomies. So the most common indication for standard bronchoscopy. Uh, this is sta standard bronchoscopy where it's not, you're not doing it in ICU. It's done on outpatient or inpatient basis. Most common indications are firstly suspected infection where usually a bronchoalveolar lavage is taken. And then the next common indication is parenchymal nodules or masses, where you try to take endobronchial or transbronchial biopsies, coming to mediastinal lymphadenopathy or masses, where transbronchial needle aspiration is done, and you have suspected airway obstruction, hemoptysis, where you want to find the source of hemoptysis, or you want to find the lesion which is obstructing, you have persistent atelectasis, abnormal opacities, and coming to lung transplant, post lung transplant, you need to take lung biopsies or you need to look for dehiscence and suspected tracheoesophageal fistulas and tracheobronchomalasias, for which bronchoscopy is the diagnostic method of choice. There may be some indications of bronchoscopy in intubated patients, such as ventilator associated pneumonia. You get hemoptysis in an intubated patient. You get airway obstruction. The patient is not ventilating. Persistent collapse on the X-ray and uh, massive inhalation with smoke, a tracheoesophageal fistula, bronchopleural fistula, and other unexplained pulmonary opacities in intubated patients may also warrant bronchoscopies. And coming to therapeutic bronchoscopies, where uh, uh, till now I have talked about the indications for diagnostic bronchoscopy. A therapeutic bronchoscopy where you want to you know that there is a mucus plug which is unresponsive to chest physiotherapy you can go ahead and do some bronchial toileting removing foreign bodies endotracheal tube management especially placement and positioning of double lumen tubes etc laser therapy photodynamic therapy electrocautery cryotherapy balloon dilatation brachytherapy which is a form of localized radiotherapy stenting, and now the new kids on the block, like bronchial thermoplasty or endobronchial valves and coils. 
So these are the common indications for therapeutic bronchoscopy. Usually therapeutic bronchoscopy is a little more advanced compared to the usual diagnostic bronchoscopy. And coming to indications for rigid bronchoscopy, you should know when to select flexible and when to select the rigid bronchoscopy. Central airway obstruction, treatment of large airway tumors by laser, agon plasma, etc. Dilatation and stenting for tracheal stenosis, foreign body removal, tracheoesophageal fistula, and for doing cryo TBLB. In these conditions, please don't try flexible bronchoscopy. You may do a diagnostic bronchoscopy, but the primary management of these conditions is mainly through a rigid bronchoscopy. So, coming to cough, persistent cough, when no satisfactory explanation is found, many a time you've ruled out common causes like asthma, sinusitis, then you go for a bronchoscopy. You may find something inside. Abnormal chest radiograph, you do a CT, there is a non-resolving pneumonia or a tumor, you may find some endobronchial lesion. Or you can take a bronchoalveolar lavage and a biopsy from the abnormal. Vocal cord paralysis, this is another common indication where after examining the vocal cords, you go inside and look for any lesions which may cause vocal cord paralysis. You get a positive sputum cytology or patient has hemoptysis with suspected lung malignancy. You are likely to find an endobronchial lesion. And of course, nowadays we are diagnosing more and more diffuse lung diseases which require a histopathological diagnosis. So in these, you don't see a lesion per se, but you go inside and take biopsies. And uh, commonly used to take samples for suspected infections where brushings, bronchoalveolar lavage, and sometimes biopsies can be taken. Uh, there are various infections which cannot be diagnosed without a bronchoscopy and a lower respiratory specimen, such as tuberculosis, atypical mycobacteria, aspergillosis, uh, mainly fungi, CMV, pneumocystis, which, uh, uh, in which bronchoscopy plays a great role. Coming to the contraindications, the absolute contraindication is an inability to adequately oxygenate the patient during procedure. The patient is not oxygenating, you cannot go ahead with the procedure and uncontrolled coagulopathy or breathing di or bleeding diathesis. And for rigid bronchoscopy, a known aneurysm or a marked kyphosco kyphoscoliosis is a contraindication. Recent MI within the last four to six weeks or an unstable angina or an unstable cardiac rhythm is also a contraindication and respiratory failure. Other relative contraindications such as uncooperative patient, uncorrectable hypoxemia, as I said, un unstable myocardium, bleeding diathesis, and uh, when you know there is a tracheal stenosis, you're not going to put in a, a bronchoscope for known patients. like So, and poorly controlled asthma. And uh, uh, you can divide the contraindications based on respiratory, where hypoxemia, the hypoventilation with hypercapnia or severe bronchospasm, cardiovascular recent MI within six weeks, unstable angina or uncontrolled LV failure, arrhythmias, hypertension, and severe carotid disease, neurological, such as active seizures, raised ICT, severe agitation, and others such as uncooperative platelet dysfunction. Platelet dysfunction and thrombocytopenia, bleeding diathesis are not contraindications for simple bronchoscopy or lavage per se, but are contraindications for procedures like biopsy. So, and relative contraindications again are cirrhosis and renal failure, where bleeding diathesis is more common. So, coming to relevant anatomy. So, this is the relevant upper airway anatomy. So, most commonly the bronchoscope is inserted through the nose. So, what all structures will we be crossing? As soon as you enter the nostrils, you, you see the turbinates and you will typically pass beneath the inferior turbinate, which is the uh, space. And sometimes there may be a deviated nasal septum there. So you have to check before inserting the scope. You pass the hard palate and then cross the soft palate. And after that, posteriorly, you get the nasopharynx, orofharynx. Then you see the epiglottis, the hypopharynx. You see the vocal cords and enter through the vocal cords, entering the trachea. So these are the relevant structures which we need to know. Which of them is posterior, which of them is anterior. So this is the bronchoscopic view. 
as we can see in a patient in supine position when we are standing at the head end of the patient and we have introduced the bronchoscope so this is what you will see after passing through the nose the posterior pharynx you will come to the this picture this is the epiglottis anteriorly the pyriform fossa on either side laterally these are the arytenoids and within the arytenoids you get the vestibular folds or the false vocal cords and then the true vocal cords and you see the posterior glottis always try to enter through the posterior part because to avoid trauma to the vocal cords if you pass anteriorly the you can see that it is chinked it is narrow so most likely you will be injuring the vocal cords so always try to pass posteriorly and the other trick is make the patient breathe deeply when they breathe when they inhale the vocal cords dilate the vocal cords abduct so at that time you get a more space to enter posteriorly to enter posteriorly go there and just retroflex the scope just bend it posteriorly and enter through the posterior glottic tree. And then you are into the trachea. So trachea commences at the level of the six cervical vertebra and uh, approximately at the level of D4, D5, it divides into the right and left main bronchus. That place is called the carina. The right main bronchus is more direct and straighter. In the left main bronchus, it runs more horizontally. So you can see that the anatomy trachea is about 10 to 11 centimeters, begins at C6, runs till D4, D5. Anterolaterally, it has 16 to 20 incomplete cartilaginous rings. Posteriorly, you have the trachealis muscle. This posterior trachealis muscle is very important because this smooth muscle continues into the main bronchi and throughout the bronchoscopy, the posterior wall, which is floppy and uh, is kind of pliable, helps you to always orient yourself. It tells you which is anterior, which is posterior. So that's important. So as you can see, these are the rings in the trachea and this is the posterior wall, which is the trachealis muscle. As you can see, the smooth muscle continues into the bronchi. This is the carina. And uh, inside, we can the luminal diameter is around 1.5 centimeter. And on bronchoscopy, we can appreciate a normal sharp carina. And uh, we should know the arterial supply and the venous supply which is through the thyroid artery branches, venous drainage is to inferior thyroid venous plexus, and through the pre-tracheal and paratracheal nodes, that's the lymphatic drainage. So these are the structures. So this is the anterior part of trachea, trachealis muscle. Immediately posterior lies your esophagus. So the layers of trachea, you have the mucose membrane, then you have the pseudostratified columnar epithelium, then posteriorly you have the trachealis muscle, and anteriorly the submucosa and the cartilage rings. So, and coming to the main bronchi, the right main bronchus, as you can see, is wider and more vertical, and it is shorter. It divides quickly into the right upper lobe and right intermediate bronchus. The left main bronchus takes off at a more right angle almost, and it extends longer. And uh, there are about uh, Several generations of bronchi followed by terminal broncholes. The right upper lobe bronchus, it arises from the lateral aspect of the right main bronchus, just about two centimeters from the carina. And it divides slightly more than one centimeter from its origin. And you get three branches designated as anterior, posterior, and apical, which I'll be showing. The right intermediate bronchus, the right bronchus intermediate continues further and the middle lobe bronchus rises from the anterolateral wall and it further bifurcates in the medial and lateral segments. The right lower lobe, the remaining segments of the intermediate bronchus continue as the right lower lobe. Initially, the superior segmental bronchus takes off and then whatever is left, the right lower lobe bronchus divides into the four basal segments, anterior, lateral, posterior basal and medial basal. The left bronchial division, it is longer and uh, it divides into the left upper lobe and left lower lobe. The left uh, upper lobe divides into the, uh, 
the lingular bronchus and the left upper lobe bronchus proper, which again divides into anterior and the pico posterior, and the lingular divides into superior and inferior. And the left lower lobe, you have it gives off a superior bronchus immediately and it divides into the anterior lateral and segment. So we must know the segments of the lung to know where each uh, bronchus will go because each segment more or less supplies. So the right lung, it has upper lobe has three segments, apical, posterior, anterior. The middle has medial and lateral. And uh, the lower lobe, it has uh, basal segments, uh, the medial basal, lateral basal, anterior basal, uh, and you have the superior segment of the right lower lobe. The left lung, you get apico posterior, you get a common, there is no separate apical and posterior in the left side. You get a common apico posterior and an anterior, and instead of the middle lobe separate, along with the left upper lobe, you have the superior and inferior lingula, and also there is an anteromedial basal in the left lower lobe. There is no separate medial basal. So these are the difference between the right and the left side. And so this is what I had described. You enter from the carina immediately into the right main. This is how it looks when you go from the head end of the patient, the bronchoscopic view. You get the anterior, posterior, and apical in right upper lobe. The medial, which is actually anterior, and medial basal, anterior basal, posterior, lateral basal, and the apical basal. In the left upper lobe, you have the lingula and uh, the other segments. Left lower lobe, you get the superior segment, apical. So this is how it looks from the inside. So this is the trachea, this is the main carina. This is in the right main bronchus. Immediately you get the upper lobe bronchus and the bronchus intermediates. Inside the intermediate bronchus, you get three openings. You get three openings. The opening on the left, which is the anterior, is the middle lobe bronchus, and the remaining openings constitute the lower lobe bronchus. Inside that, the rightmost or the posterior most is the apical basal and the remaining constitute the right lower lobe bronchus, the basal segments of the right lower lobe. So these are otherwise, inside the upper lobe bronchus, you get the RB1, RB2, and RB3. They are apical, posterior, and anterior, named uh, clockwise. And inside the middle lobe, you get the RB4 and RB5, which is the lateral and the medial segment. And uh, the RB6, which is the apical segment of the left, uh, right lower lobe, and the remaining uh, basal segments, RB7, 8, 9, and 10. So that is how they are made. Again, the left main bronchus, it divides into the upper lobe and lower lobe. This is the left main carina. And uh, inside the upper division, you have the LB4 and LB5. And uh, in the lower lobe, you have the LB6. It will be 8, 9, and 10. This is the upper division, inside which you have the LB1, 2, and 3. And this is the lingula, superior and the inferior lingula. So each bronchopulmonary segment, you know the anatomy. So this is important because uh, uh, when you're sampling the distal airways, the alveoli, so this is where you'll be taking the sample from. So you'll be literally going till the almost the bronchial level, and these are the alveoli. You won't be reaching the alveoli, but it is important to know what the anatomy is like. So beyond that, you have a lot of, you can see how vascular it is. You have the bronchial artery, you have the pulmonary vein, you have the bronchial vein. So this is uh, important because taking transbronchial lung biopsies from the distal uh, alveoli, it can be quite, they can be quite torrential bleeding. And the reason is because of the bronchial arteries which go distally and you have the pulmonary arteries and you have the pulmonary veins. So that is important to know. Coming to next, the patient preparation, more or less, you take a consent, you give a lignocaine test dose, basic investigations have to be done. Patient has to be nil-oral, pre-procedure meds and some uh, anti- uh, anti-anxiolytics. So let's go step by step. All patients need to provide an informed consent prior to the procedure. Written information in advance should be given. 
you can probably give a handout and uh, risks of the procedure, alternative approaches, everything should be discussed before the final consent. Usually performed on an outpatient basis with conscious sedation, patient should be advised not to eat for at least six hours, but the clear water may be allowed for up to two hours before the procedure. It is always important to have a checklist, verbal and written checklist, and uh, full blood count and clotting um, uh, coagulation studies, especially prior to bronchial lung uh, biopsies and in other interventions, informed consent, spirometry if saturation is less than 95, ABG if oxygen saturation is less than 92, ECG if there is a history of cardiac diseases, and uh, if patients are to have any sedation, ensure that someone is going to accompany them home after the procedure and remind them that if they are sedated, they will be unable to go home alone or drive home. Gain an IV access. Consider bronchodilators if there is evidence of bronchospasm. And if very high risk of endocarditis, uh, though it's debatable, uh, consider prophylactic antibiotics. In the checklist, first check if the patient has a CT scan. CT scan should be performed, I would say, performed prior to any bronchoscopy, any routine bronchoscopy. Uh, uh, elect for elective bronchoscopies, always CT scan is best. It allows the bronchoscopist to select accurately the segment of the lung which has to be sampled. And it also demonstrates the presence of mediastinal lymph nodes and allows additional procedures such as TBNA. Uh, you may just feel that there is a lung collapse and you may go and do the bronchoscopy. But actually, there might be a large necrotic lymph node sitting and it may require some additional procedure. Or you may think that there is only a peripheral lesion, but it may show a central lymph node. So, and it may also hint at other anatomical abnormalities which are not explained on a plain radiogram. So, CT scan is must. Baseline heart rate, blood pressure, oxygen saturation should be recorded before and after a procedure. Acute MI a repeat is a contraindication within six weeks. ECG monitoring should be used. And uh, please, uh, I have seen torrential bleeding with bronchoscopy, so I am warning you. Identify risk factors for abnormal coagulation. If there are patients on anticoagulant therapy, if or patient is on antiplatelets, especially clopidogrel, liver disease and kidney disease, and prior history of any bleeding tendency or active bleeding, Perform if you are planning to take biopsies, always safer to perform coagulation studies, platelet and hemoglobin. And uh, bronchoalveolar lavage can be safely performed if uh, it's more than platelet count is more than 20,000. But uh, for biopsies, generally recommended to have more than 50,000 platelet count. Clopidogrel is to be stopped five days prior to an endobronchial or transbronchial biopsies. However, low dose aspirin may be continued. So, for non-emergent biopsies, antiplatelet drugs should be stopped within five days, especially clopidogrel. Heparin can be stopped within 12 hours. Make sure the platelet count should be more than 50,000 and INR less than 1.5. Go back to the history. Ask about recent medical events. Any ongoing or recent myocardial ischemia, decompensated heart failure, any exacerbation of asthma or COPD, any life-threatening arrhythmias, because I cannot stress that patient safety is most important. Patients with asthma, they should be optimized. Nebulized broncos or bronchodilators should be given. Patients with COPD with also should be optimized and nebulization may be given. And for COPD, additionally, remember that when sedating COPD patients, they very easily go into type 2 respiratory failure. So uh, kindly keep that in mind. Patients with ischemic heart disease, Get a cardiology opinion and a cardiac clearance and ideally delay for uh, bronchoscopy for four to six weeks after MI. Age alone is not a contraindication, but uh, take care while sedating older patients. This is how a consent form should look like. Initially, the name, diagnosis, age, sex, the condition and the treatment, and uh, it should be written, the following condition and the following procedure name, and uh, the doctor should write it in presence of the patient and which of the following procedure will be performed it has to be ticked and the risks have to be listed and such a in such a format it should be acknowledged the patient should acknowledge the doctor has explained the medical condition and the procedure 
the risks in general and the risks specific to the patient, the anesthesia if it is required, other relevant treatment options, and the risks of not having the procedure. And uh, it should be guaranteed that this procedure may only be diagnostic and uh, there is no guarantee that the patient condition may improve after the procedure. It may include a blood transfusion, tissues may be removed, life-threatening events may happen, but they will be treated. Uh, and any other doctor may also conduct the procedure. Because uh, uh, this is very important in uh, today's day and age, where we have to be safe, both, the, both for patient side, they should understand what they're going through, and to avoid uh, unnecessary litigation in case of any adverse event. Such a written consent met, must contain all such things. Usually, it is printed in English and one of the regional languages. And uh, uh, you have to give a safety information sheet about the anesthetic, about the bronchoscopy and the biopsy. And the patient should be able to ask questions. Please give them time to decide. Please give them time to ask questions before signature. And also, if required, a video recording may be taken. All this must be documented and then go, go forward. Just before the procedure, monitor saturation, supplemental oxygen may be given by a nasal cannula. Pre-medication, always better to pre-medicate with atropine. Morphine and benzodiazepines, fentanyl may be used for sedation. Topical anesthesia. Sedation is less commonly used for diagnostic flexible bronchoscopies. But uh, topical anesthesia plays a very important role in uh, both avoiding sedation and in both reducing the need for uh, the dose of sedation. So benzocaine lozenges may be used. Lignocaine is used in various ways as jelly, as a spray via atomizer, gargle, or nebulization. Additionally, as we do the bronchoscopy, we use, use boluses of 1% to 2% lignocaine, called a spray as you go. And of course, subcutaneous cricothyroid injection may be given. So lidocaine is a class 1B antiarrhythmic, please remember. It reaches peak concentration in serum. It is absorbed very well through mucous membranes. And don't think if that you're giving only topical lignocaine, it doesn't reach the blood. It does. Goal is to always keep the total dose less than 8 mg per kg. However, however, keep the dose as less as possible, preferably less than 4 to 5 mg per kg, I would say. So you may use a jelly of 2%, maybe 5 ml, that would come up to 100 mg. Please load 1 ml of 2% lignocaine. Or you may even use 1 ml of 1% lignocaine, which would add to about 20 mg each. Keep 5 or 6 preloaded syringes ready like this and label them. And use a nebulizer. Nebulize the patient with either 3 ml of 1%, 2%, or 4%, which will add up to this much. Atomizer or a spray. You can give 10 ml of 1% or 10 ml of 2%. And this is typically done to the posterior pharyngeal wall. And gargling may also be done, 2.5 ml of 2%. And this is how a lignocaine injection is given to the trichothyroid. The trichothyroid is palpated and just the needle is pierced. This is how it is sprayed. And this is how using a tongue depressor, depress the tongue and using an atomizer, about uh, 10 ml spray. This is how the lignocaine jelly is given into each nostril. And this is how the patient is positioned in supine position for the procedure. Also check the scope. Very important. Just don't check the patient. Check the scope before the procedure. So this is the lever. And uh, you have to be able to antiflex to about 180 degrees and retroflex to about 90 degrees minimum, maybe 120 degrees. And also check the suction, whether it's working. And these two buttons for capture, freezing, white balance, etc. Also check the biopsy forceps. Very important to check these prior to the procedure. Because once you go in, you cannot go about checking these things. So all these things must be checked before the procedure. Open and close the forceps to see if they're working. Select the proper size of scope. Remember, do not force the bronchoscope through a closed glottis. Repeated removal and introduction must be avoided. And do not prolong it more than 20 minutes, especially in children. How do you select the size of scope? For older children, more than 12 years in adults, you can select a 
six mm scope, which is a standard. But for smaller children, they will re they may require pediatric uh, scopes of five mm or lesser. And explain the procedure, allay any fears, keep talking to the patient, and allow the patient to verbalize any concerns, ob obtain the consent, and uh, ask the patient to perform a good mouth care, like a chlorhexidine to minimize the risk of introducing bacteria. It may be introduced either via the nostril or a mouth. Through the mouth, a white block is usually used. And apply 2% lignocaine gel using a sterile gauze on the scope. Remember about infection control. That itself is a separate topic. But remember, protect your instruments, protect yourself and your staff, and protect the patients. Coming to the basic steps. This is how you'll be standing in a flexible bronchoscopy. You'll be standing at the head end. Patient will be supine. You'll be typically introducing it to, through the nose. And in front of you and to the patient's left side will be the monitor. After anesthetizing, place the patient in supine position. Allow the scope to pass into the larynx and through the glottis. At the vocal cords, more lignocaine is sprayed, typically two or three times. At the vocal cords and again inside, within the trachea, to prevent the cough. It's important to give adequate lignocaine to prevent cough, but also keep track of how much lignocaine you're giving. And as the instrument is advanced, epiglottis and larynx come to view and ask the patient to say E to observe the movement of vocal cords. It is important to do this and document any vocal cord palsy because later on the patient may go to another person. He or she may diagnose the vocal cord palsy patient may come back and tell you that because of the procedure, I got a vocal cord palsy. So always document the vocal cord palsy. If it is there, it is part of the findings. And uh, instill lignocaine followed by 5 to 10 ml of air. And passing beyond, observe the trachea, the main carina, the segmental bronchi. Observe the patency, configuration, and deviation of trachea. And also observe the position of carina the degree of sharpness of carina, which is very important, because if the carina is blunt, it means that you may have some subcarinal lesion like a lymph node. And please also observe for transmitted pulsations, which may indicate any vascular structure uh, just below the carina. So, and then the orifices of the right and left main bronchi are examined. And uh, as you go, keep spraying 2% lignocaine. The scope is passed further well inside and uh, till the first and second generation bronchi till where the scope reaches. Important to go systematically. Always go in a systematic fashion. For example, go into the right side, observe the right upper lobe, observe the apical, posterior, anterior, then go into the right main stem, go into the right intermediate, observe the right middle lobe, medial and lateral, then the right lower lobe, the apical segment, and the basal segments. Similarly, come back to the carina. Always examine each lobe systematically. Another tip, if you know which side is abnormal, please go into the normal side first. The reason is, if you go into the abnormal side, you will directly go and start doing the procedure what is required. You see the lesion, you, won't, you may miss something important on the other side, which may be related or unrelated. Let's say a patient has a uh, lesion in the left lower lobe bronchus. You take a biopsy. You forgot to examine the right main stem bronchus. There may be a secondary there, which may preclude, a, which will upstage the patient. The patient will become stage four then, metastasis to the opposite the lung. So always, or there may be something unrelated, like a foreign body on the other side. So always examine systematically each lobe and each segment and always go into the normal side first. And then, if you're performing pulmonary toilet, removal of mucus, aspirate each bronchus until it's clear. Sample, do whatever sample you have to take. So this is how the procedure is done. This is how the normal saline is pushed for bowel. And select a proper size, as I said, do the precautions. Monitor, keep monitoring the patient's oxygen saturation. Uh, one person must always take care the main bronchoscopist may be focused fully on doing the procedure but one team member must always ensure that the patient is not desaturated 
desaturating. And four basic rules of bronchoscopy, keep off the walls, never advance blindly. Keep off the walls means keep the scope in the center. Never advance blindly, don't force it. If you feel that the vision is blocked, do some gentle suction or instill 5 ml of saline and just uh, you may rub the wall, uh, your scope against the tracheal wall. If you feel lost, pull back until a point that you can recognize, usually the carina. And if the patient is coughing, use adequate meds like lecithin. The other rules, walls to the back. So always orient yourself such that the posterior wall, which has the smooth muscle, use that to orient. On the screen, it will appear down, which is the posterior. Carina is your friend, visit her often. The right middle lobe and lingula are actually anterior. Remember that. And the apical segment of lower lobes is posterior. If you remember this, you can easily do a bronchoscopy. So I'll just play the video. So, so this is the anterior wall of the trachea. This is the posterior wall of trachea. As you go inside, this is the carina. On the right side, this is the left main stem bronchus. This is the right main stem bronchus. As I said, on the right side, you have the upper, middle, and lower lobes. The left side, you have only the upper and lower lobes. Now you enter the left side. This is the left upper lobe bronchus and this is the left lower lobe bronchus. Enter the left upper lobe. The anterior one is the lingular division. This is the anterior most and this is the an anterior division of left upper lobe and this is the apico posterior. Within the lingula you have the superior and inferior. This is the superior and this is the inferior. This is the left lower lobe. This is the basal segments of the left lower lobe. Always remember the mnemonic ALP. ALP. So anteromedial, lateral, and posterior. This is how they'll appear. Coming to the right side, you are into the right main bronchus. This is the right upper lobe and right bronchus intermedius. Within the right upper lobe, you may sometimes not be able to see the apical segment fully. But uh, yeah, if you give a little bit of antiflexion, you can see the apical segment. That is the anterior and posterior. Come back to the right main bronchus and to the right bronchus intermedius. Here you have the right middle lobe, the superior segment of the right lower lobe, and the basal segments of the right lower lobe. Of this, this is the medial basal segment, and these are the remaining right lower lobe segments. Within the middle lobe, you have the medial. And lateral. The medial is more anterior and the lateral is posterior. This is the apical segment of the right lower lobe. You've entered the right lower lobe per se, the basal segments. Here again you have the ALP, which is the anterior, lateral, and posterior. Don't forget the mnemonic of ALP. Coming out, we have the medial basal segment.
always don't forget the rules of bronchoscopy keep keep off the balls never advance blindly when lost pull back until a point that you recognize carena and use medicines so complications you are worsened hypoxemia hoarseness or sore throat transient fever cough and bronchospasm infection bleeding pneumothorax or arrhythmias all these can cause all these are the common complications of bronchoscopy apart from that injury to the teeth which may occur if you go through the it's more common with rigid bronchoscopy injury in the nose hemorrhage at the biopsy site laryngeal edema so and uh, age related concern with children especially children are at higher risk of hypoxemia so if you want to do pediatric bronchoscopy then uh, make sure you are quite experienced so fever uh, i would say fever bronchoscopy mild hemorrhage and uh, hypoxia are the common uh, uh, complications pneumothorax occurs usually only after a transbronchial lung biopsy infection very less common laryngospasm edema rare but life threatening aspiration cardiac arrest respiratory depression hypotension quite rare but you always must be aware of all these complications for these select the proper size scope do not force through a closed glottis and don't try to cross the vocal cord again and again and don't prolong the uh, bronchoscopy keep the patient in a humid atmosphere as they feel very dry watch out for respiratory distress and uh, watch out for this may be due to laryngospasm or subglottic edema watch out for strider and post procedure instruct the patient not to eat or drink because the gag reflex has not returned for approximately 2 hours and the patient may aspirate and observe the patient for hemorrhage small amount is okay but large amounts can cause a chemical pneumonitis and uh, observe the patient for an hour or two and then if they are fine then you can uh, continue and most important don't forget about scope trauma because uh, on one side you have complications to the patient but also equally important to ensure that your uh, scope is not damaged because it's uh, uh, quite a valuable equipment and for amateurs especially you have to be careful of that the procedures the basic procedures which uh which we can call the level 4 procedures or the basic ones are bronchial brushings an endobronchial biopsy a transbronchial lung biopsy a bronchial bronchoalveolar lavage and a conventional or a deep stbn these are basic procedures which every every bronchoscopist must know so what are the tissue samplings which can be taken brush cytology a needle brush a ebp or a tblb or a tbna and uh, bronchial brushing is a cytological study it is for uh, suspicious mucosal lesions you take a brush and uh, you smear it on a slide bal or a lavage is usually done to re recover material from terminal bronchioles and uh, usually a scope is wedged into a segmental bronchus and 100 to 200 ml of saline is instilled and uh, suction is applied this is a bronchoalveolar lavage commonly used to diagnose infections or alveolar hemorrhage and next is an endobronchial biopsy for mucosal and submucosal endobronchial lesions which uh, biopsy can be done under direct vision and uh, usually a biopsy forceps is advanced and a piece of lesion with a if preferably a surrounding normal lesion is grafted and biopsy and management of bleeding after biopsy is important this is how an endobronchial biopsy is taken various malignant and benign endobronchial lesions can be seen and from these directly a biopsy can be taken uh, take care to, to avoid too much bleeding be gentle with the biopsies if there's too much bleeding just stop the procedure and you can use cold saline adrenaline as i told the various uh, things you can use to manage bleeding after an endobronchial biopsy transbronchial biopsy is for diffuse lung diseases and alveolar pathologies like consolidation it's a basically a blind biopsy 
after wedging the bronchoscope into the distal segment, and the forceps is advanced till resistance is felt, and then withdrawn and biopsy is taken. Fluoroscopy or radial levers guidance may be used. Conventional TPNA, a CT scan is mandatory. The lymph node stations are identified, and uh, various methods like jabbing, hub against wall, piggyback, and cough techniques are used. These are the four basic applications of conventional diagnostic bronchoscopy. Coming to advanced bronchoscopy, you have a whole spectrum. Coming to advanced diagnostic bronchoscopy, you have the radial EBUS or the conventional EBUS, electromagnetic navigation, autofluorescence, NBI, and uh, all these are to improve sampling. So you have a peripheral lesion like this, you can do a radial EBUS. You have a central lymph node, you can do a curvilinear EBUS. And you have various lymph node stations which we can uh, uh, sample, autofluorescence bronchoscopy, NBI, which will identify abnormal mucosa. And coming to, these are advanced diagnostic bronchoscopy. Coming to therapeutic bronchoscopy, you uh, can uh, 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 diagnose and treat strictures, foreign bodies, you can dilate strictures, you can stent them, foreign bodies, mucus plugging. Uh, you can treat uh, central airway tumors, bronchioliths can be removed. For Now for asthma, you have bronchial thermoplasty. For emphysema, you have coils and valves. For tracheoblancomalacia, you can stent. And uh, you can use various procedures in therapeutic bronchoscopy, like laser, electrosurgery, cryotherapy, photodynamic therapy, brachytherapy, etc. And uh, massive hemoptysis, in which there is a role of interventional bronchoscopy, you have options like adrenaline so pledged, uh, Fogarty balloon tamponade, an electrocautery, a cryoablation. You can have stents, you can have bronchial artery embolization, you can have bronchial blockers. This is how a Fogarty is inserted and the bronchial blocker is placed. And removal of foreign bodies. These are various foreign bodies like cap of a pen. You have a dormia basket. You have this alligator forceps, you have a three prong forceps, four prong flexible grasping hooks, Fogarty catheters, you have laser bronchoscopy. Uh, other one other application, therapeutic application, is to correctly place a double lumen endotracheal tube. And this is how endobronchial uh, bronchoscopic intubation is performed, selective bronchial intubation is performed. You have a brachytherapy which can be given, photodynamic therapy, rigid can be used for debulking tumors, argon plasma coagulation, electrocautery, electrosurgery, stenting, which has uh, revolutionized the palliative management of central airway tumors. Patients are able to get a, a very good quality of life. You have 100% stenosis like this, which can be resolved with stenting post-intubation stenosis and uh, so these are the major milestones which you have seen we've come a long way in fiber optics shigeto ikeda from him we got uh, the needle aspiration by wang use of laser radial probe bus convex probe bus electromagnetic navigation bronchial thermoplasty and today bronchoscopy has become the most commonly performed diagnostic procedure by a pulmonologist and uh, almost every single ailment can be treated today. So level four is basically your diagnostic wash, brush, EBB, TBLB, et cetera. Level three is I have advanced diagnostic like convex probe EBUS. Most of, most of us would want to achieve either level four or level three. Level two can be only done with specialized centers like therapeutic bronchoscopy, which usually require uh, rigid and uh, then you get advanced therapeutics and today success of lung transplantation cannot be imagined without the flexible scope and uh, uh, one of bronchoscopy's great teachers Atul Mehta commonly says what is the largest foreign body a pulmonologist has ever removed from the endobronchial tree and any guesses the actual the answer is actually a thoracic surgeon so the thoracic surgeon has been um, uh, removed from the domain of lung cancer. So the future belongs to ideas, innovations, and yet you have to remember the past and you have to remember the basics.
So there is a lot more in the future, like valves, like coils, like uh, electromagnetic virtual bronchoscopic navigation, IoT grafts, cranial replacement, tracheoplasty, endobronchial stents, etc. And uh, your uh, uh, 3D printed stents, stents. And uh, so you had in your early years, usually it was a rigid scope for foreign body removal. Till day before yesterday, you had a flexible scope, which was a curiosity. Yesterday, flexible scope became very popular. Today, as a diagnostic and therapeutic scope tool, the rigid scope has got resurrected. And tomorrow, again, the flexible scope is going to become more popular. And so Atul Mehta commonly says, there is no disease of the chest that a flexible bronchoscope does not diagnose, palliate, treat, or manage. So uh, always remember that it's all about a teamwork in interventional pulmonology. You have the anesthesiologist, the radiation oncologist, and the cytopathologist, thoracic surgeon, the radiational intervention radiologist, the GI person, the thoracic surgeon, the ENT person, and a pathologist. It's all about a teamwork. Please remember that. And also in conclusion, remember these things. Intervention pulmonology is not just intervention. You have much more than that. You have to be a good bronchoscopist to be a good interventionist. Interventions alone don't make you a better bronchoscopist. And because it could be done, doesn't mean that it should be done. Because you, ha you have to remember the complications and one has to be larger than his or her abilities. Patient welfare is most important more important than self-gratification or adrenalizing. And uh, this is one um, uh, uh, sentence which my teacher commonly told. A group uh, bronchoscopist is the one who knows when not to perform the procedure. So you might examine a patient. You might see that patient has a lung mass. The patient might have a just a peripheral lymph node. That itself might suffice for the diagnosis. So you must know when not to perform the procedure and think of alternates to bronchoscopy as well. And also we must be reducing our healthcare costs. So in conclusion, I would just say that bronchoscopy is an important tool and it has revolutionized the field of pulmonary medicine, but you must also know the potential risks and complications and you must know when not to intervene as well. Because as young postgraduates, you might be thinking that all cases can be done with uh, bronchoscopy but uh, all of us learn that when not to do is learning that is more important than when to do so with this i'd like to conclude